الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praises for Allah alone Patients be upon our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his family and his companions Brothers and sisters Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to another episode of Lessons in Islamic History. We've been on quite a journey, beginning with the greatest calamity to befall the Ummah of Islam, the death of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, through the Khilafah of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq Radiallahu Ta'ala An, through some of the events that happened during that time, towards the moment of death of Abu Bakr radiallahu an and how Abu Bakr chose Umar al-Farooq radiallahu an to be the next Khalifa and then we looked towards the east and the Muslim conquests of Persia the events that we're talking about right now in the north towards the Levant towards Sham and indeed the conquest of Jerusalem these events that happened towards the north of the Muslim Empire during the time of Umar remember that they are running concurrently at the same time as the battles that we heard about in Iraq so at this point we have taken a step back and at the same time as Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and before him Abu Ubaid al Thaqafi Rahimahullah Ta'ala are fighting the battle of the bridge and then Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas at the battle of Qadisiyah. Around a similar time, the Muslims are gaining vast swathes of land in the area which we know as Asham or the Levant, i.e. the area of Syria, of Lebanon, of Jordan and of Palestine. And we're going to hear how the Muslims moved through the Levant and how they eventually conquered Jerusalem and some of the lessons that we can learn from the actions of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu when he captured Jerusalem and indeed some of the lessons that we can learn from the battle of Yarmouk and the battles that happened before that. So beginning as we said with the removal of Khalid ibn al-Walid, Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah is in charge of the Muslim army in Asham. And they begin out towards some small areas and towns. One time they vastly misjudge the number of people in the garrison and they're almost surrounded. But Khalid ibn al-Walid is given the responsibility of leading a detachment of cavalry. And he comes and after the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the efforts of Khalid ibn al-Walid and the horsemen, they are able to overcome this garrison and they take their eyes towards the rest of the Levant and towards consolidating their control. Now to understand just how this works, we have to understand about an alliance that was going on at the time. And that is an alliance between Heraclius, the Byzantine emperor or the Byzantine ruler, and between the Persian ruler at the time. The Persian ruler who was the one who had sent out Rustam to fight against Abu Ubaid al-Thaqafi rahimahullah and against Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu to the east in Persia. And the idea of this is that the two of them together would come together and weaken the Muslims and attack Umar from multiple sides. They wished to extinguish the nur of Allah, the light of Allah with their mouths. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wished to complete his light even if the disbelievers hated. In the end of time, the Prophet ﷺ told us that the non-Muslims will gather together against the Muslims like the lions gather around prey, all of them together eating from the carcass. This was tried at the time of Umar. 
and it failed. And the reason why it failed, brothers and sisters, is the lesson that we have to learn, the first lesson we're going to learn today. Why did it fail at the time of Umar? And why is it succeeding today? The same idea, two great empires, the Byzantine Empire in the north, the Persian Empire in the east. The aim is for the two of them, Heraclius and the Persian Emperor, are going to work together to conquer the Muslims. Why doesn't it work? We're going to hear some reasons for that. But I think that's something you need to bear in mind. Why doesn't it work then? Or why didn't it work then? And why does it work today? Look at the difference in the Muslims. Look at their difference in their approach, the difference in their trust in Allah, the difference in their Tawheed, the difference in their following the Sunnah, their worshipping of Allah alone, their implementation of the Sunnah of the Prophet of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at their difference in their piety and their obedience and their love of the Akhirah and their hatred of this world. And then look at us today and look at the difference in us. And then it's easy to understand why the enemies of Islam are given control over the Muslims. And we've said before and we'll say again that these early battles in Islam during the time of Abu Bakr and the time of Umar, they reinforce the lesson in our minds that it's not the power of your enemy that overcomes you but it's the amount of sin and disobedience to Allah Azza wa Jal that you do that overcomes you. The Muslims were fighting an empire, two empires on two different fronts. What nation takes on two giant empires at the same time on two different fronts with handfuls of men, small numbers of men, outnumbered, outgunned in every single way. The weaponry of the enemy is greater. The power of the enemy is greater. The strategy of the enemy and the aim of the enemy, every single thing, it looks to the observer from the outside that the Muslims have no chance. But as long as the Muslims rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trust in Allah, they worship Allah alone, they implement the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Allah azza wa jal sends his victory to the Muslims. At the end of the last episode, we got up to the point where the Muslims had conquered Damascus. And from there, the Muslims spread out with group of the army heading towards Palestine, towards Jerusalem, and another group focusing on the northern part of Syria. And this left Damascus unguarded. Heraclius, when he saw this, he saw the opportunity to go back and to take Damascus once again. And so there was another battle for Damascus, another attempt to overcome Damascus just as there was the first time. What stood in the way of the Byzantine Empire conquering Damascus and the small Muslim garrison? Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an had heard that there was this attempt going to be made. He had intelligence that an attempt was going to be made. And he sought permission from Abu Ubaidah to gallop back with his small mobile guard and to fight to defend Damascus. Abu Ubaidah himself moved towards other parts of the north of Asham in order to try to attack them there. The second battle of Damascus ended in victory for Khalid ibn al-Walid and the Muslims radiallahu an, and they were able to defeat the commander that Heraclius had sent to try to overcome Damascus once again. Even in the northern parts of Syria, the Muslims were making great gains. And one of the reasons why the Muslims were making such great gains is that the Byzantines had treated the local people so badly that the local people opened up their lands to the Muslims in many ways. And yes, there were fortresses of the Byzantine Empire dotted about and those were attacked by Abu Ubaidah, by Khalid ibn al-Walid and by others. But the land that lied between the fortresses the Byzantine Empire were relying upon the tribesmen, the local people of that area to defend the Byzantines against the Muslim army. But they treat them so badly. They treat them so badly that when the Muslims came, the vast majority of them helped the Muslims against the Byzantines. And this was one reason why the Byzantine Empire crumbled so quickly. We see this is a lesson for us in the way that we treat people, even in the way that we treat non-Muslims. And that is why you see that the treatment and the positive way that the Muslims dealt with their enemies 
and dealt with the neutral tribes people and dealt with the people who either paid the jizya and had the protection of the Muslim army or those people who accepted Islam in their early days, the way the Muslims dealt with them was a major reason for the fall of the Byzantine and indeed the fall of the Persian empires. Both of them, major reasons why they fell was the rebellion within them from groups of their people. And that was because of the good treatment of the Muslims towards them. And the offers that the Muslims made. The jizya is something which has a great amount of barakah and a great amount of wisdom in it. That they pay a tax. They don't participate in the Muslim army. They remain in control of their lands. They remain in a situation where they have the help of the Muslim army and the protection of the Muslim army whenever they need it. And it's not permissible for the Muslims to attack them. Likewise, the treaties the Muslims entered into with the non-Muslims. This was a time of treaties. In fact, it was said that the first conquest of Damascus happened because or partially because of a treaty between the Muslims and between the people living there. There's nothing wrong with us making these treaties with the non-Muslims to the best of our ability when there's a need to do so and when there is a purpose for doing so and when the conditions of those treaties are fulfilled. As long as they fulfill the obligations towards you, fulfill your obligations towards them. This was what caused this great victory in Syria. And then of course the Muslims were able to march towards Jerusalem and it's that we're going to talk about in the next part of the episode inshallah ta'ala until then. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Knowledge insufficient I was born into a Christian family My years and years and years, 30 odd years studying Christian belief There was no relationship between what the preacher was saying and what was in the Bible Attitude incorrect Philosophies incorrect PhD holder in Christian theology to come and teach, but the book that he was using was the writings of Imam Ghazali. You have to be equipped first. You must have good knowledge of your deen. Gaining knowledge or spreading Islam. But confusions cleared. Islam in question. Do you believe in God and the last day is important for you? Teaching people how to do dawah effectively. Islam is a way of life. As the world grasps the Islamic perspective, Islam understood in Islamic Quotient. Every Saturday at 4.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 2 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. A servant is not afflicted with any punishment greater than having a stiff heart and being away from the Almighty, the Compassionate. Hearts are God's vessels on the earth. The most beloved ones to Him are the softest and the most purest. If hearts are nourished with God's remembrance and quenched with his meditation, it will witness great wonders and deep wisdom. Since our hearts are enlaced with layers of oblivion, we need to cleanse them to stand sound and pure before Allah. To know more, Join us on Peace TV's new series on Healing Hearts, where we can join together the caravan of the sincere servants of Allah. Let's try and purify our hearts from all destructive sins to taste true success in Healing Hearts, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, welcome back. We're talking about lessons from Islamic history and we've reached the point in Islamic history where we come to talk about the events that preceded the conquest of Jerusalem. And this particularly was the Battle of Yarmouk, 
What happened was that the Byzantine Empire was being routed, particularly by Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an in Syria, and especially in the northern part of Asham. They needed to make a decisive response. They needed to come and hit the Muslims. But Heraclius had an idea. He didn't want to fight against the Muslims in open battle. He didn't want to engage the Muslims all at once together. Instead, he wanted to break up the Muslim army, deal with Khalid ibn al-Walid in one go, deal with a part of Abu Ubaidah's army in one go, deal with another commander's army in another go. When Khalid ibn al-Walid heard of this, he feared that Heraclius's plan was going to be successful. And so he counseled Abu Ubaidah He counseled him to gather the Muslims together in one place with one single battle, one single army. Because this would be more decisive and it would stop the army of the Byzantines from breaking them up. Of course, the Byzantines were relying upon the Persians to defeat Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas al Qadisiyah. When they failed, they had no reinforcements to come from the Persian side. They had no one to draw away the troops of Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah into Persia. Even if they thought they couldn't get reinforcements from the Persians, at least they thought that perhaps they would draw away a number of the Muslims into the direction of Al Qadisiyah and the battle that was taking place in the hope that they would lose their concentration and they would split their numbers. The victory that happened over the Persians at Al Qadisiyah meant that it was extremely difficult for the Byzantines to muster the kind of numbers and the kind of attack against the Muslims that they wanted to do so. As it happens, it turned out that this great battle that happened between the Byzantines and the Muslims like Al Qadisiyah was the great battle that took place in Persia. Yarmouk was the great battle that took place in the Levant. Abu Ubaidah ibn al Jarrah, at least at some point in the battle, left control of the battle to Khalid ibn al Walid, appointed Khalid ibn al Walid as the field commander for a large part of the Battle of Yarmouk. And after a number of days, Khalid ibn al Walid was victorious, radiallahu ta'ala an, and the Muslims with him and they were able to smash the Byzantine Empire in that part of the land. And this opened up for them a route to a place that must have been very much on the radar when it came to the Muslim conquests. And that is Beitul Maqdis, Jerusalem. As the war council of Abu Ubaidah took place, they took some time to consult each other and to decide which areas should be attacked next. This is the principle of Shura that we see in all of the military conquests of the Muslims. We see these huge efforts, these huge sacrifices by individuals and then we see this process of Shura. Consulting the commanders, consulting the various people, consulting the companions and they decide to lay siege to Jerusalem. They laid siege to Jerusalem for a period of four months. Again, showing the patience that is needed by the Muslims. Didn't come straight away. Allah didn't say that here come the people of the worship of Allah against the enemies of Allah, open up the doors for them. But instead, it took them four months of hard siege. In the end, the people of Jerusalem made a pledge or they made a treaty. And that treaty was that they would surrender the keys of the city, but only to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. They would only surrender Jerusalem to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. As for the capture of Jerusalem, then the siege that took place by Amr ibn al-As, who was later to go on to capture the whole of Egypt, was a well-documented siege and it was said that the Byzantine army ran into the walls of Jerusalem and they closed it and they fortified it with swords and shields and catapults and all kinds of things around the edge. It was then said that Amr ibn al-As was the one who was commanding the Muslims at that time 
And it was said that Abu Ubaidah was commanding the Muslims as well. And the Byzantine general who was in command of Jerusalem at the time, he wrote to Amr ibn al-As saying, You are my friend and my counterpart. Your position among your people is like my position among my people. You will not conquer any part of Palestine after this, so go back and do not be deceived, lest you be defeated like those who came before you. Do you think that this broke the resolve of Amr ibn al-As? No. Amr wrote back to him saying, I am the one who is going to conquer this land. When the Byzantine general read the response of Amr ibn al-As, he replied to him back saying, no, the one who is going to conquer Bayt al-Maqdis is a man called Umar. Although there are different reports in this regard, one thing that all of the reports agree upon is that Umar was the one who came to sign the treaty and to take responsibility and to take control of Jerusalem and to arrange the surrender of the Byzantine troops. He left Ali ibn Abi Talib in charge in his absence and he brought with him reinforcements for the Muslim army in Syria. It is said that when Umar came to Bayt al-Maqdis, there were knowledgeable people within Bayt al-Maqdis who had known that the person who was going to capture this city was going to be Umar radiallahu anhu. Either they had known that from their scriptures or they had known that from some of the things, the knowledge that had been passed down to them or from their interpretation of dreams, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But there were people, holy men, and commanders within the city who knew that it was going to be Umar radiallahu anhu who was going to conquer the city. When the people responsible for Jerusalem saw that Umar had come, they opened up the doors of the city and they released the efforts to defend themselves from the siege of the Muslims. They came out to Umar ibn al-Khattab asking him for a peace treaty and agreeing to pay the jizya. When we come to talk about the conquest of Jerusalem, there is something that is mentioned by almost every single person who talks about this conquest. And that is the way that Umar radiallahu an traveled to Jerusalem and the way that Umar took the responsibility for the city. Umar radiallahu an traveled to Jerusalem on a donkey. The leader of the believers, the chief of the believers going to meet the leader of the entire area one of the most senior leaders and certainly the most senior religious figures in the whole of Asham, the Levant area. And Umar goes to meet them traveling on a donkey. And this shouldn't surprise you because this is how the Prophet Wasallam used to be. When Abu Ubaidah said to him, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, you're going to meet the leaders of the people, suggesting to him that he might want to leave his donkey. What did Umar reply? Umar said, Allah has honored you with Islam. If you seek honor elsewhere, you will be humiliated. If you think that honor comes from riding on a horse or riding with a great number of soldiers or having a great deal of fanfare around you, Allah will humiliate you and disgrace you. Honor comes from Islam. Izzah comes from Islam. This is how Umar used to be. When Umar arrived in the Syrian area, and was preparing himself for his travel to Jerusalem, he gave a speech. He said, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood as I'm standing now and said, be kind to my companions and those who come after them and those who come after them. Then there will come people who will swear an oath before being asked to do so and will give testimony before being asked to do so. Whoever of you would like to attain the center of paradise, let him stick to the united body of the Muslims. For shaitan is with the one but further away from the two. No man is alone with a woman except that the shaitan is the third one present. Whoever feels happy when he does a good deed and feels bad when he does a bad deed is a believer. When he met Abu Ubaidah, he said to Abu Ubaidah, let us go to your dwelling place. Abu Ubaidah said, what will you do at this place? All you do is weep for me. He entered the house and did not see anything. He said, where is your furniture? I do not see anything but a saddle, a plate and a water skin. And you are the governor, do you have any food? Abu Ubaidah went to a basket and took out some pieces of bread. Umar wept and Abu Ubaidah said to him, I told you that you would weep for me, O Amir al-Mu'mineen. Whatever gets you to your destination is enough. Umar said, 
this world has changed all of it except for you, O Abu Ubaidah. And Dhahabi commented on this incident saying, this is by Allah true zuhud. It is not the zuhud of the one who leaves all of their worldly possessions till they have nothing. Wallahi zuhud, ya ikhwan, zuhud, leaving the world is not about wearing woolen clothes and living in poverty with no food. But zuhud is that you have enough to reach your destination of paradise and you don't take any more than that. This is zuhud. That you have enough to reach your destination in paradise and you don't take anything more than that. Umar had seen the conquests of the Muslims, the lands of the Muslims open up, gold and silver pour upon them from every corner. And he found Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah radiallahu an with the tiny possessions that he had, a saddle, no furniture, and a few pieces of bread. And what gets you to your destination of paradise is enough. And Umar said to him, everything has changed in the world except you, O Abu Ubaid. Until the next episode, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.